But first up, on a star-studded, action-packed show, where better to start than with a man who is having the season of all seasons. He's become Mr. Saturday. Take a look at this. Harry Skelton for his brother Dan. Protectorat's going to land his big target here. Harry Skelton working with every sinew on Lamilo and just lifts the Coral Gold Cup. Black down that is courageous and wins the beat there for the Skelton. She keeps on trying and she's jumped superbly to win the Hampton Novices chase for Dan and Harry Skelton. Grey Dawning is running on courageously here. The Grey has taken over. Grey Dawning is going to win the Ballymore Levington. And Stuve Negra barely having to be shaken up to make a winning seasonal reappearance. It's Midnight River for the Skeletons. Midnight River from Thorolin Silver. Midnight River for the Skeletons. Time flies. Last time he was in the Luck on Sunday studio, he hadn't been champion jockey yet and hadn't ridden all those big race winners, Harry Skelton. Things are going pretty well, I'd say. Yeah, for sure, Nick. Um, the last few months have been fantastic and we've had a bit of uh, luck and they've gone well. Yeah, that idea of you know, targeting these big, valuable Saturday prizes from a long, long, long way out, we always knew that you know, Dan and you would have shades of shades of the nickels about you, but but that is taking it to a whole new level, isn't it? Yeah, um, to be honest, you know that turn of we always had a lot of winners um, numerically, but the turn to get those better horses, um, yeah, it's just been unbelievable. Those bigger races and um, a lot of that's down to Dan really is planning, and you know it takes time though. Where do you think the turning point came? Could you identify? A point where where you all sort of sat down and and realised that a change of strategy was necessary, or or desirable, not necessary, but desirable. Um, I suppose necessary was good was a good way of putting it. Really, it was necessary because that's where you want to go. You know, you've got to try and go to that next level. But it wasn't really a case of just sitting down and suddenly it happened. It's taken time, um, but Dan's had that plan for a long time, and you know now. You know, I think a lot, a lot of the owners were on board to try and, you know, go to that next level as well as a team. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, then suddenly you're bringing horses along through like Protector at who wasn't easy to start with. Um, we always knew he was a good horse, but it took a bit of time to get him to where he is now. Um, and then, you know, luckily, I suppose um, you have your first grade one with it with Roxana. Um, and then things just started to filter to filter in then. Mm. and. But it takes a long time to produce those horses to get to where they are now. How much have you enjoyed the journey with with Dan? Yeah, the the idea that you can actually work with a member of your family and make it make it productive is not something that comes easily to everybody. No, not at all. To be honest, we've me and Dan have been from as long as from the day I was born. We've always been together. Um, we, you know, from a very early age, he's just always been there. So. You know, he's been by my side. Um, so, what's the age difference between you two? Um, five years. Yeah. Um, the parents split up when when we when I was quite young, um, and to be honest, without him, the whole way through my life, I would never have been where I was because um, we had a bit of a you know a rough patch when we were younger um, with family life. But he was just always there. He, he brought me through. Um, that's always been like that. It's never been any different, and I'd never want it to be any different going forward. Um, it's the two of us, and we're very lucky that Dad Dad has obviously put on that map. But to en enjoy now what we're doing is yeah, it's fantastic, and there's definitely um, I wouldn't want it any other way. So he's always taking care of you. Yeah, without him, Nick, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what would have happened to be honest. Um, but um, we still have our arguments, but I suppose that's good and healthy. Well, it's very, it's very productive if you can if you can still argue, and it can have a it can have a happy outcome at the end of it, especially with yeah. horses. Yeah, but it's like, you know, I think there's no, you know, I think a lot of people probably in 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 business have there's a sort of a certain barrier way. You don't don't cross that line. There is that, but at the end of the day, I can say anything to him. He can say anything to me. We might not want to hear it, um, but I think then that leaves no stone unturned going forward. You know, because then we can between us we can we can get it right. You know, from your perspective, obviously, as you say, you you have total faith in him and you completely carried along with what he was doing. 
Could you see quite a clear vision right from the outset when you, you be began training? Um, well, when we started, we started with 12 horses and the intention was just to train winners. That's, mm. you know, it's about winning. I think with dad coming through, you know, his career, what he's done, it was always about winning. Um, so we just basically wanted to start out and, yeah, just train winners. And I suppose that happened. It didn't happen straight away. Um, but then once the ball started rolling, you know, his, basically his drive and his, he's just, you know, so forward thinking that it was never not going to let it happen mm. to go to the next, you know, to go to the next level as such. It just snowballed really. And one minute we had 12, then we had 20, 40. And the next thing is <laughs> his box is going up everywhere and a lot of staff were needed. And yeah. I mean, did, did everybody always feel in control of the situation or when things start to snowball like that? Yeah, sometimes I don't. I wonder whether it's in control, but he, he just Dan. Someone always he wants more, you know. Like it's just never enough. It's he wants more. He wants, which I suppose is good. Whereas you know we're all the same, but I think well I, we I don't know how long we've been there now, but the, the building works never stopped. Like it's it's like a building site. It has been for the last fifteen twenty years. Um, but that's the way they are. Are you contrasting personalities at all, or or do you essentially share the same principles? Oh no, I think there is differences between us. Um, but I think we both want the same thing. Um, yeah, we want to be be successful. We want to train winners. And um, I've had my turn. I was champion jockey, but well, there's now one one more thing to get, and you know we we'll just keep working towards that now. All right, a trainers' championship. It's, I mean, it's not completely impossible this season, though you do have a the formidable Nichols in your way. And yeah, I mean, you you guys, all people, know how hard that is. Very, um, and you know, Paul's very very hard man to catch. He's, you know, his his determination still now. He's been doing it all them years. He's just unbelievable. He just, he, you know, he he never switched off, and he is by far the, the hardest man to to beat. Um, but um, we'll give it a good go. So people talk about the Nichols blueprint and you know Dan being the sort of natural heir or the natural successor or whatever. Are there are there very clear differences between the way they do things or the way they are? Um, I think obviously we you know when Dan was at university and then he went to Paul, so he's learned the racing. You know everything he's learned has been down to Paul really. Obviously then since he's gone on training himself. You know, you make mistakes and you learn from your own mm. mistakes, then you have to. But everything that we've learned has been, you know, from Paul, really. Um, I was at Richard Hannon's um, when I left school early. Um, and my dad probably realised it was a waste of time sending me to school. I went to Richard Hannon's, then I went to Paul's after a year. So I was there, I think, nine years. Dan was there, 15 or so. Um, so we've learned everything from him. Um, but no, Paul calls him mini me, I think. Was <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, I can see the similarities between the way they train, the way they do things, and the way they're thinking. I think Paul would say, Paul, you know, Dan, Paul would know what Dan's thinking before he's thought himself. So I think, um, you know, we're, we're always thinking probably the same. How crucial is it to you then that you're still the stable jockey to give Dan that first trainer's championship? Oh, yeah, yeah, crucial, yeah. <laughs> so you will go on um, and on and on until yeah. that happens? Yeah, for definite. Yeah, um, I just want to like I love riding. I love horses. Like you know, I've never owned, known any different. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to ride just for as long as I enjoy and as long as I, as long as I can. Yeah. Uh, people have talked a lot about this celebration this season, but am I right in thinking that with Midnight River in particular, there was a a real emotional significance to that for you? Yeah, there was. Um, celebration really to start with wasn't really meant to be anything it just I think John Grossick got a picture of Ashtown lad crossing the line I had my arms out does gonna give him a big pat and the next thing is people thought it was something and then I suppose some people enjoyed it some people didn't but Midnight River you see him there like his his ears are pricked he's <laughs> it's hard not to get attached to these horses um, I'm in the yard every day we've had that horse since a three-year-old um, we broke him in um, we've, we've produced him through his career. I rode him out a lot as a three-year-old, a four-year-old, and 
produced him all the way through and there's a lot of satisfaction mm. to get him to that point to win a race at Cheltenham. OK, it's not the festival, but people might think, well, what on earth is he doing? It's only a handicap, but that's not it's what it's about. It's a pretty good race, to be fair. Yeah, it, I'd be pretty happy if I won one of those. Yeah, it doesn't... Uh, like. To me, it's it's more than just a race, or yeah. you know the fact that I've had a lot to do with that horse, and you get emotionally attached to them. You probably shouldn't do, but um, he's definitely high up on my list as a favourite. You know, it's interesting because you, you, you're almost in a unique position there. That, that your intimate knowledge of the horses that you're going out and riding in races is is so great, and I wonder at what point that really helps you, and to what extent sometimes that is difficult for you. Yeah, I suppose I think it's, it's definitely our biggest, my you know, biggest asset that I know the horses inside out. I know exactly what they want to do, what they don't want to do. But on the other hand, sometimes you probably know a little bit too much. Sometimes, um, but yeah, like I'm in the yard six days, seven days a week, mm. um, and yeah, you know them inside out, and I think that's that's only a plus really. If you you say you get emotionally attached to them, if you lose one or. You know, you're riding one who picks up a, a serious injury or worse. That must be very difficult to then pick yourself up from. I know it's bad for any jockey, but when they're they're on your doorstep every day, yeah, it, yeah, that is by far the, the worst thing about the job is losing is losing one. Um, like I've been stood at the back of hurdles and fences with stable staff, Dan, um, with with stable staff crying their eyes out. You know, all of us, and they do it for the love of love of the horse mm -hmm. as well. You know, don't think they're in it for to, to earn great money and and have you know all this big house and fast car. They do it for the absolute love of the horse. I see that every day. Um, but losing one, it, let me tell you now, I wouldn't begrudge anyone who celebrates a winner because when you lose one, that's hard. Horses have been your life to such a great extent. Can you ever escape them or not? No, not really. They're just this. Yeah, I, you have always been around them. It's all I've ever known. So um, I struggle to switch off now. It's always, you know, it's all horses. That's what it's always been. And of course, you're you're married to a jockey as well, second jockey in your yard. Um, is that is that straightforward in terms of job, work life balance? Yeah, I think um, obviously Bridget's a very good jockey first and foremost in her own right, and. You know, Dan needs someone like her because, you know, on the days that I can't ride and, you know, Dan has full belief in her, in what she's doing, in her own ability. Um, now she's been riding a little bit longer and she has more confidence, you know, I think to start with, was it, you know, she was maybe a little bit nervous about going into it, but now, you know, it works really well. Um, you can see when she's given the horse, she's more than capable. Um, I'm probably greedy. I want to ride them all. That's what she <laughs> says, isn't it? <laughs> but there's there's quite a lot to go round. Yeah, there is. Um, but I think you know it works so well that if I can't ride them, Bridget rides them, and and the owners know that. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've got. You know, that's the way it is. Um, and um, yeah, me and Bridget are very lucky to have have that. You know, sort of backing that. We you know when we get on a horse, you know, we're all on the same page. We're all. We're all there to do the same thing. And you're all working towards the Yeah, we're all the working common, towards the same the, thing. The yeah. common goal. Yeah. This season has been has been outstanding. I mean, Protectorat really got the got the ball rolling, didn't he, winning winning that, that bet fair chase. Um do you in your heart of hearts believe that this is a horse that is now ready to win a gold cup? Um yeah, I do. Like i I think the the feeling he gave me at Haydock, um He'd never really given me before, um, so I think he, you know he is really improving. He's going the right way. Um, he ran very well in the race last year. If he came up a bit softer this year, you never know. Um, they say if you don't win the Gold Cup on your first run, it was hard to do. But um, in recent years, obviously, a plus tard has, has put that statistic right. So you know, mm. I think going forward, um, if it came up softer, he's definitely a better horse this year. So he's improving and going the right way. What sort of race do you think he actually ran last year? We can see where he finished and how far he finished behind. Yeah, I think he ran. He he, he ran a very solid race. There were still good horses behind him. Um, he made a bit of a mistake at the last, but he's a real good stayer. Um, sometimes I think 
you know, sometimes you get a horse that actually wins a Gold Cup, we've seen in the past. Mm. Maybe not like the best horse wins a Gold Cup, but if the ground comes up a little bit different to maybe, you know, the best stayer can win a Gold Cup. Um, yeah. You've seen some quite big prices win a Gold Cup, not maybe the best horse. He can't be slow to do what he did at Haydock. No, no, no. He's, listen, sharp track he, there. he's not a stayer, but, you know, you've got to have it all, haven't you, really, mm. to be a Gold Cup, Gold Cup horse. You've got to speed, you've got to stay, you've got to jump. He's he's got it all. He, so he, he, has he goes next weekend, yeah. He's gonna go next weekend, yeah, to uh, to Chatham to Cotswold Chase. And he's in good order. He's in good form, yeah. Um, I've ridden him a bit this week. Um, it's not the nicest now to be riding at home every day. He's quite awkward and difficult, but um, I don't ride him that often. But he's in good form. Okay, so he's your he's your big big hope for the for the remainder of the season. Where might we see? Um, your your winner of the of the Beecher Chase Ashtown lad. We, he was in the Potemps. He was in the Potemps final um, after the qualifier last week, and I guess he's in the Grand National. Is that the easy 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 plan for him? Um, yeah, he's got a few options now. Um, he's obviously qualified for the Potemps race. We'll definitely have to have a look at that. Um, and then I think probably a trip back to Aintree um, will probably be most likely. I don't think it'll be in the National. I could see him probably running in the Topham. Um, do you not think he'd Just, stay in the national? Well, he ran in the Scottish national um, and travelled like a you know like a winner the whole way. But um, when I turned in, the lights went out and he definitely didn't stay. And um, I think probably riding in positive over over a shorter trip. Um, obviously, them fences brought him to life, um, so he'd probably go back there for the top. And, and again, this is a this is a good celebration when <laughs> when, when yeah. Ashtown Lad wins. So you were going for the same John Grossick photo there, were you? Yeah, that, well, was the, that was the, the, the moment, I suppose, John Grossick caught that photo. Um, but like, if it gives people enjoyment, then, you know, it's great. Do you, do you feel like you have to do it now, like Frankie de Torre? Do you feel... Well, some people... Is it now a millstone round your neck? <laughs> yeah, some... You've got to keep delivering. Yeah, yeah I suppose. But some people, you know, you know, say it's great, want to carry on. Some people say it don't. But, look, I'm, I enjoy my winners, you know, and I enjoy winning... Um, you know, and I suppose now if it gives people enjoyment as well and it's good for sport, then good. That's it. I mean, it, it, it's so evident the pleasure you get from what you do. And I think we, we sort of lived through so many eras of jockeys sort of telling us how really it kind of tortured their, their soul. And yeah, you, you have the same drive for winners, yet you seem to be able to take the enjoyment out of it as well. Do you realise how kind of lucky you are in that respect? Yeah, I do. Like I, I suppose wearing my heart on my sleeve a little bit. I do, you know, you know, just how I am. I, you know, I think it's very lucky that I'm comfortable in my job and comfortable in, uh, you know, who you are. Who, yeah. So just be yourself, really enjoy it. And I think it's, you know, you get nowadays, especially probably a lot of people saying, "Oh, you need to do this," or "You need to be him," or you need, that's, yeah. I think that's a pretty torrid way to live, really. People dictating on how you need to be. Um, and there's actually, I, I actually, years ago, I listened to a podcast, a high performance mm -hmm. pub, sports podcast. Mm -hmm. With Jake Humphrey. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's, they've had a lot of sports players on there in the past. And listening to some of them about how they lived their life in sport and the pressures of their job that they did and never ha and very, very successful sports people and never, ever enjoyed one kick of the ball or one pass of the ball. It's quite sad probably and they've achieved a hell of a lot so I think yeah just live in live in the moment and just enjoy it if you're enjoying it and listen there's down times as well and but that's when you're saying reverting back to like losing the horse it way it outweighs the the, the, the positives you know they're, they're, they're the hardest days mm -hmm. to overcome but you have to go forward you know you have to be able to put it behind you I'm lucky that I've got a lot of rides coming the next day so it's it's you know, it's not easy, but it, it helps you move forward. But I think, yeah, you know, just try and be yourself, really. But to what extent does the fact that when you were at your least successful, you were barely chiseling out double figures in a season help you enjoy what you've got now? Does it? Gi did that give you s some context? Oh, yeah, massive. Like, you know, I think one season I had probably eight, I think it was eight winners, and... The season before, I'd done quite well, and then you're suddenly down to eight, and you think, what on earth's going on? But um, I never didn't believe, um, but luckily Dan came along at the right time. But 
yeah, to achieve it now to where what it was was, yeah, it's, it's nice. Mm. And, and the fact that there was never any doubt, it seems, that you were going to be riding all those horses either. Did, no. did you know that right no, from yeah. the outset? No, no, there was never any doubt. Like Dad set it up, you know, for us, and it was always that we were going to do it together. That's what it was, you know, obviously Dan trains the horses in the yard, it's his yard, but it was always together. That was just the way it's always been. And we're going to talk to a, an amazing equestrian later on who's, who's now 80. Your dad's a long way from that, but he's a man with extraordinary um, spirit, um, determination, had an amazingly long and successful career. How's he adapting to having to be a little less... Act, I suppose actively involved. Yeah, like he's still very busy himself. He's all over the world. Um, he's in America at the minute working. Um, I suppose when we started, you know, he's always there whenever we need him to yeah. ask anything. He lets us get on with it, which is great. But if there's anything about the way one's jumping or the way Dan might approach a situation, he's always there at the end of the phone. But um, I think now that you know, when he set it all up for us, you know, it, you can always, it doesn't matter what you're given in life, you can always mess it up. So I think the the fact now that things are going really well, I think hopefully he's very proud and enjoying it, you know, and I think he is, and we speak every day, if not twice a day, um, always there at the end of the phone, and he's still got a busy life working hard and what he's always done for not quite 80 years, but he ain't far behind. <laughs> what what's the, what's, do you think is the secret to his longevity? in terms of his career? Um, just, uh, I think, I think success breeds success and he was successful very young um, and he wanted to be a jockey but then success took him down the show jumping route. Um, just, yeah, he's just so driven to, you know, he's, he's a worker, he's always been this way, he's always been this way, he's always been brought up. He started off at Ted Edgar's, that was a very hard man to work for. Um, he'll say that I think the first three years, all he did was polish Ted's boots and collect his cigarettes. Um, but that was installed from, from a very young age, so he's just, he's always, he's always been a hard worker. And, you know, you only get out what you put in. And um, I think it's just his drive and... Um, yeah, he just he just wants to succeed all the time. Like he's just, he can't stop. And he seems, from the outside, somebody who's pretty consistent in terms of the way he 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 approaches life. Is that something that runs through all of you? That degree of consistency, consistency of approach. Yeah, I think so. Like consistency is key, isn't it? You know, it's, I think if as a jockey, as a trainer, if you're always doing the same thing, you know what you you know what. The, the, the trainer will know what the jockey is going to expect and I think consistency is one of the you know one of the things I think in, in anything that you need to have because if I ride a horse Dan knows really what my manu you know what my move is going to be and as long as it's consistent I think you can work from that but when you're inconsistent and you're, you're doing things indifferently and I think then that probably becomes through a lack of if you're inconsistent you probably a lack of confidence and then that's when maybe things don't go quite right so I think consistency is definitely something you need in in sport definitely and and in life and and are you are you happy with your place in the world as a as a senior jockey someone who's been champion jockey do you feel a bit of a bit of responsibility for your for your fellow riders because you've you've achieved that position um yeah I do I suppose when you look at it like that I always wanted to be champion jockey and I was lucky enough to have the you know the horses and the position to be in to to go and achieve that, um, but yeah, I, um, you know I think now I'm getting a bit older. Um, there's a lot of younger lads coming behind. It just show you that it's, the sport is is a young man's game really. It's, you always got someone coming behind you, but I like that because you always it keeps you on your toes and it keeps you wanting to achieve and um, keeps pushing you forward. Mm. Um, but I think responsibility. Yeah, I suppose now as a senior jockey, you, you do have that. Um, uh, hopefully, if anyone wants to turn to to me to ask anything for any help, I hopefully I can, you know, put something to the table. All right, you're going to stay with us for a, for a little bit for the moment, Harry. Thank you very much. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.